Well, I spoke with Norris as I do every Sunday morning prior to church, and I said, Norris, I'll be waving at you, so are you waving back? That's my only question. It's hard for me to tell. Can you guys up there checking Facebook? Is Norris waving? Yeah, it looks like it. All right. Well, we continue today on this journey on the harvest of hope, a sermon series based off of 1 Peter, which is called that epistle of hope. And in the past, I have, uh, past few weeks, I've shown you pictures of uh, fruit, uh, I've shown you pictures of soybeans. Uh, one Sunday, we added a picture of horseradish growing. Um, last week, it was a grain elevator. And today, I offer a piece of farm machinery. So if you'll take a look, it uh, should be a... Anybody? That is a John Deere 2230, which I uh, looked up the largest ones that they make. They make one that's actually 70 foot wide. That one's not. But could you imagine dragging basically a mobile home the wrong direction as, you're, as you are cultivating? That is a cultivator. It's not a planter. It's not a seeder. It's not a plow. It is a cultivator. And a cultivator, uh, and once again, I, I grew up in a farming country. doesn't mean I'm a farmer, and, and I, I don't want to ever sound like I really know what I'm talking about in that regard. But I do know that you, to cultivate, you break up the ground, and that's what it's doing. It's, it's, it's ripping through, breaking up the, the, that which is hard on the top and even deeper, allowing the crusty soil then to breathe. And it's actually done in preparation planting prior to planting the seeds it allows then when seeds are put in after you've done this for the water to go in it removes some of the weeds if you will it actually pulls out some of those as it's pulling along and allows the nutrients to go down along with the water into the ground making it easier for whatever you've planted to sprout up through that broken ground so today, I would like for us to consider as we are on this harvest of hope, and actually you can do cultivating prior to the planting, and you might do it even after you've gathered the crops to prepare the, the ground for the winter, uh, to just to turn it over one more time. But I want us to talk about cultivating hope, cultivate hope, um, as we dig once again into this First Peter uh, chapter 3 today. Uh, we're returning where we had kind of left off last week. Just by way of reminder, this is a circular letter that was written to um, new Christians that were scattered throughout Turkey, Asia Minor. And it was given uh, to one person who would carry it to one church. It would be carried on to another church. And that's why at the very beginning of this book, you'll notice the different names of different cities that received this letter uh, from Peter inspiring hope, telling them that even though they were aliens in a foreign land, even though they were probably those who were less in class and social status than the residents of that land, he calls them a royal priesthood. He tells, tells them that they have a living hope, and he tells them of the goodness of knowing and following Jesus our Savior. So let's walk through some of these same slides, recalling what hope is. Hope, the Greek word elpida, is to anticipate what is sure. It is a confidence in what is going to happen. Not so much like what we have in our modern day use of the word hope. So it, for me, as I've said in these previous weeks, I've changed the way I even speak now because I used to say, I hope we have this for dinner. Or I hope this. But hope is to anticipate what is sure. I hope I'm gonna have fajitas for lunch. It means I'm gonna go buy fajitas, right? Okay, here we go. So the next part, is you apply it to biblical hope, it's that assurance that God's promise of my inheritance is imperishable. God has promised us everlasting life through his son, Jesus Christ, and nothing can take that away from you if you have received Christ into your life. And then finally, based upon that, wherever there is full assurance of hope, there is faith, and faith is the full assurance of hope. So we have talked about in previous uh, weeks, born to hope, uh, a duty to hope, build on hope, bloodline of hope, submit to hope, a co-op of hope last week. And today we do talk about this idea of basically digging down and cultivating hope in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, begin with verse 10. And here Peter builds upon these instructions that he's been giving about submitting to authorities, submitting 
uh, unto masters, submitting unto our spouses, and he even gives us some words on how to get along by living in harmony, if you recall those verses 8 and 9. But we'll uh, look at verse 10 through 12, just three verses today, and it's really a recap of Psalm 34. If you're familiar with that psalm, it's about verses, I think, 12 through 16 of the 34th psalm that Peter is using. And I love how even in the New Testament and New Testament writings, we see the importance of learning scripture. He's connected back with what he has read and been taught over the years and applies it now even in this Christian life uh, that he has called, God has called him and inspired him to write. So verse 10 begins with four. So in other words, he's saying after all these things, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. And his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider cultivating hope in our lives today, and as we look at some of the things that uh, in farming we do and we cultivate, we see that Peter has offered for the readers basically a formula of what we need to do if we want to have a good life and we want to enjoy life. And at the same time, he's told us that if you don't do these things, and if you practice evil and you practice wickedness, that your face will be set against us. We will suffer the consequences of our sin and our evil ways. So today I would ask you to touch our hearts, speak to our minds, help us to examine ourselves, help us to think back on how we talk to one another and talk to our world and talk to our community, talk to our children, our spouses, even those that have conflicting opinions to ours. How we deal with one another. Because Peter's already told us in the earlier verses that we are to live in harmony with brotherly love and to do good to one another. Father, speak to us in this hour, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Cultivate hope. Cultivate hope. Peter tells his readers, if you want you know, for if you've did all these things, you know, you've submitted and, and you're living in harmony and you want to be compassionate and, harm, and humble. For if you would love life and, and want to see good days, you've got to keep your tongue from evil. So if you want to love life, enjoy life, have good days, then there are some things you need to do. Some cultivating that needs to occur. And if you're going to grow good days, you'll need to cultivate what you've planted. Everyone wants to have good days, right? How many of you wake up in the morning? This is going to be a bad day. <laughs> That's only when there's no coffee, right? I mean, you've, you've gotten a little further in the day before you say that. But everyone wants to have good days and, and they want to enjoy. I mean, he says love life. I think you could say enjoy life. And I think that'd be a, a good way to, to make it into a more modern understanding. Uh, we, we want to, to have good times. But it's just we all have different opinions on what it takes to have a good time and to enjoy life. You know, for some it's money, others it's possessions. Some it's education, some it's position. For some it's health, some it's family, some it's fame, travel, on and on. But Peter says, if you really want to have a good life, if you want to enjoy life and to have God's blessing... You've got to do these things. But if you want a life of deceit and of evilness, God is going to turn his angry face on you, if you will. He's going to turn his face against us. So if you desire the former, that of a good life, to love life and, and enjoy it, let's begin with, with pull weeds, pulling weeds. Now, I never liked to do that much. My dad liked to ask me to do that, actually told me to do that. This week we're walking around the property and, of the church, and um, I told Pierce that my dad would often 
get the rake out in the fall when the leaves have come and all that, and he'd rake about a one foot by two foot section. And th there would be nothing left other than the strands of grass, every little twig, every little acorn, every, you name it, maple things that come down, you know, those little spinny things, everything was gone. And then he'd say, I want the rest of the yard to look like that, boy. We had about two acres. And I would shake my head and say, yes, and no, it was never going to happen. But, and I'm sure he did too, but it kept me busy. James says that the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Now I'm referring now to James, just a book or so earlier. James says that your tongue will set things on fire. And that a world of evil is amongst the part of the body called the tongue. It corrupts, he says, the whole person. In fact, let me just read that to you. This is James, the third chapter. I'm going to go with verse 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. How many of you people know that you've let your, they'll say you let your so-and-so overload your such-and-such? -such. Your mouth, your tongue makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a, a word, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And then he goes on, says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea have been tamed and are being tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord. We said, holy, 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 and with it, we curse men. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. You who have been made in God's likeness, men who have been made in God's likeness, we curse. And out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. I am not suggesting today that we pull out our tongues. Because I guarantee you, even mute people can be evil. Think about it. You don't have to have a tongue to be evil. But this is the illustration we're using today. I would say... Hold your tongue. How many times have you heard that in your, in your life? Hold your tongue. Bite your tongue. Don't let your, tail, your tongue start wagging like your tail. And we might see less fires and less evil becoming a stronghold in our mouths if we would hold our tongues. Think about what you say. Talk less. Practice silence. We play this the quiet game at my house with the grandkids. And I wonder if we couldn't play the quiet game more in our lives, listening. Making sure that what you say when you do speak, you speak carefully and you encourage other people's hearts who hear you. Now I know I've suggested it in the past, that if there could be a recording of everything you said in the past week, would you want it played on the loudspeakers here in church? Probably not. But I will tell you this, those of you who are, have access to social media, your Facebook, your Twitter, or whatever app you're using, those words have been contained. And I wonder this week if we were to throw up on these slides, these screens in the back, everything that you have posted this past week, would you stay seated in the pew? Or would you have to get up out of embarrassment? Has there been more posted on your accounts of your faith, of forgiveness, and of your Savior, Jesus Christ? Or more about politics, politicians, hate, and prejudice? Those online conversations are seen by the redeemed and the lost. What kind of witness are your posts making? How we live determines our joy or our destructive, evil future. Peter says, avoid deceitful speech. John Piper, as he illustrates this verse, says... You don't love people when you deceive them. In fact, you're advancing your own purposes at their expense when you are deceitful. 
Deceitful speech is not just dirty words, curse words, saying bad things, telling dirty jokes. It's that and so much more. It's lying. It is maligning. It is degrading other people. It is judging other people. It is gossiping. It is hating. It is speaking prejudice and anger rather than the love of Jesus. Pull the weed. Hold your tongue. Like that bridle or that rudder, make sure you don't repay evil with evil. Take hold and follow Jesus. There is power for good and bad in our words. In fact, they can be like dominoes. Watch this little video. Within our words, an unseen power is set in motion. The tongue is a small thing, but like a tiny spark can set a great force on fire. Once spoken, our words begin blazing a trail through the hearts and lives of those around us. One kind word can demolish guilt. It can inspire hope. But the same words have also embraced hatred and executed innocence. Once spoken, our words scorch their feelings and emotions on a level that only they can produce. Your words set up a chain of events beyond your control and of which you will never know. One word can destroy beliefs, harden hearts, or cultivate hatred. But they can also demonstrate faith, display forgiveness, and nurture love. The power of life and death lies in a single word, and we, the image of God, have this power in one word. Pull weeds. The words you use, choose them wisely. Speak of the word. Who is the word? Jesus. Second, turn soil from verse 11. Hang on, let me get back to that. I was in James there for a second. All right, uh, verse 11. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. You know, one of my favorite uh, sections of Lowe's and Home Depot, besides the automotive tools, are the yard tools. You know, the lawnmowers. What, what man doesn't want to jump on one of the big riding lawnmowers? Or get a chainsaw and just, you know, imagine cutting down something. Or uh, the newest weed eater, weed whacker, you know, you just got to have that. Even maybe a tiller. Tiller's a small version of the cultivator I showed you earlier that John Deere makes. In fact, they do the same thing. They turn up the soil, and we're talking about turning soil now. In Genesis 2, the 15th verse, the New Revised Standard Version says that God put man in the garden to keep it and till it. To till it and keep it. Till is a good translation, if you will, of the Hebrew word abad, which means to turn over, to plow. Um, and as we talked about at the beginning, tilling allows things, cultivating allows things to grow, and you have to turn over the soil to do that. And tilling in our lives, I believe, is a central task, one that God has entrusted us to, as he did Adam, that we might fulfill his intentions of his work here on earth. We need to turn away from evil. We need to turn over the soil and do what is required by him to love life and enjoy life and see good days. By cultivating our lives, by turning away from hate, by turning away from division, deceit, and evil, the hard soil of your heart is where some of us need to do some tilling today. With all the political commercials on in the past few weeks, um, I stumbled on this one, and I want you just to watch it. It's not even from our state, but go ahead and play it, guys. Weeks until the election, you are probably seeing political ads everywhere, but two opposing candidates in Utah, where they're apparently politer than most places, wanted to share a different message. Check it out. I'm Chris Peterson, and I'm Spencer Cox. 
We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me... Yeah, but, but really you should vote for me. There are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve, approve this message. message. Ever seen that before? Chris Peterson, the Republican candidate, Cox. Spencer Cox, posted the ad on Twitter saying, I'm not sure if this has ever been done before, but we decided to try something different, adding, let's make Utah guys an example to the nation. His tweet alone has been shared more than, I just looked this up, it's now gone from 10,000 to 16,000 and 2 million views. Spencer then added, I wanted to thank Chris for willingness to record the PSAs. No matter who wins the presidential election, we must all commit to a peaceful transfer of power and all work work together. Now, if you watch that commercial and started thinking, well, they're probably Mormons. <laughs> I don't live in Utah. I don't care about it. It's a governor race. It's not the presidential. If you have any of those thoughts, you have missed the beauty of that commercial. Two men with opposing ideas undoubtedly opposing platforms, opposing political parties, but have agreed not to speak evil, to hold their tongue, to turn over the soil, if you will, and to conduct themselves in peace. Seek peace and pursue it, the scripture says. Don't let a hard heart develop in you. Turn from evil. Don't let the weeds of life take hold in your heart. Don't plant evil or deceit wherever you go. Instead, be like John Chapman. Oh, you might know him as Johnny Appleseed. Born in the late 1700s, actually he was like 1770-something, late, late 1700s. Died around 1844, 1845, who was actually a missionary. And yes, as he went, he planted little nurseries. I'm sure some of you learned this in your elementary school lessons. For some reason, I pictured him in all the things we did with a steel pot on his head. I don't know why, but I don't remember the portion of that. But uh, he was known for proclaiming the gospel wherever he went. And yes, uh, growing apple trees. So as you go... Don't plant evil. Turn over the soil. Till the soil. Cultivate hope in your life. And plant goodness. And finally, as you look at this passage, water. So it's pull weeds, turn over the dirt, and water. Those are basically, I mean, how many of you in kindergarten got a paper cup? And somebody made you put dirt in it. And somehow you stuck down some piece of seed of something. I don't know. Probably was a lima bean. Maybe it was a piece of corn. I don't think corn would probably be harder to go. And then you had dirt in your paper cup, your little Dixie cup there, and you had a seed in there. And what did you have to add to make something grow? Water. You had to have sun eventually too. But those are the three major elements you needed. You needed the seed. You needed the dirt. You needed water. For the good days that Peter points out and says that if you want to have life, love life, and have good days, you need to seek peace and pursue it. It's like the water for the seed in the dirt. But oh, how we love to fight. Baptists are known as battlers. Wherever two or three are gathered, they'll start two or three new churches. <laughs> As individuals, many of us love to be contentious. We, we hold grudges and we pride ourselves on, I haven't forgiven that guy since grade school. Now they're 90 some odd years old. Remember this earlier guidance from verse 8. Finally, of all of you, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because of this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. 
And that blessing would be loving life, seeing good days, and then the rest of that. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The face of the Lord against those. Were you ever in church and you're, you're doing something with your buds? I mean, mine was, the church I grew up in, um, traditional, even though it's from Illinois, traditional, what I would think of a southern style church, big columns in the front. It had a wraparound balcony and most of the young people sat in the balcony because when you get older, you don't want to do the stairs. That's before they ever built the lift and that stuff like that in our church. And we would set up there and before they had air conditioning, we would actually throw windows out the back window, uh, throw windows, throw paper airplanes out the back window. So you'd go the furthest into the parking lot and you'd be over there drawing. I know some of you young people, you would never draw on the church bulletin, much less. The, the Bible or the hymnal that's in the pew, but you might. And, and, and you're there messing around and your mom catches your eye. She gives you the stink eye. I mean, the angry eye. You ever had that happen? Yep. And you immediately, it's like water thrown on a fire. That, that whatever you were doing stops. It, it ends at that point. And you seek peace and you pursue it. Because when you get home, she may have a piece of you. Let's stop the evil in our lives. Let's stop speaking with ang anger and, and hatred. Because, as Peter says, the righteous, God, he hears their prayer. His eyes are on them. But the face of the Lord, that... that the angry eye, if you will, is against those who do evil. So let's mend the brokenness that evil brings to our lives and seek peace so that God's face will smile on us and his ear will be open and inclined to our prayers. Finally, I stumbled on a book this week. You'll see this next slide. It's called Mending the Divides, and it's a book about... Um, global, uh, the global impact of the church and how the church should be in the business of mending broken relationships. And even though I lived in Japan for three years, I'd never heard of this. Kintsugi, that's my Japanese pronunciation. Mark was there for three years. Were you there three or four? Three? Um, it is the uh, ancient art from the 15th century of taking Japanese pottery that has been broken and mending it back together, usually with gold sometimes with silver. And the broken pieces, by being mended, are even stronger than they were before they broke. And the beauty of the gold allows that even a simple piece that was just a simple white bowl there now becomes this more elegant piece that has been put back together. And when it comes to our lives, whatever brokenness that you might feel today, Jesus is more than gold, but he has paid that ransom for your sin. He has given to you what you might need and what we all need to put our lives together if we'll put him in the center of our lives and serve him. So ask yourself this morning, do I need some of this kintsugi stuff for my brokenness? Or is there a relationship that I have been a part in breaking that needs to be mended? Can I be one who speaks good, one who seeks peace and pursue it? And can I go to that one and start to mend a broken relationship? Let the forgiveness of Christ, the love of the Father, be that gold that restores whatever brokenness you feel today. Stand with me, please. We have a time of prayer. Our Father, as we come now to an invitation time in this service, uh, this passage, each one of us can find, us, find ourselves on both sides of it. Oh, there are times we can sing holy, holy, holy. And there are some times that we would never want others to reread or to hear what we either posted or said. But Father, I would pray today that we might turn over, that we might till up the hardness of our hearts, that we might remove the weeds, those that are robbing us of the goodness of your love, and Lord, that we might water it with your Holy Spirit.
that we might grow strong in our faith in Jesus Christ. Father, whatever decision there is to be made today, let your folks know that the doors of the church are open. If there's someone here who wants to come and kneel at these steps, now's their opportunity. Lord, if there's somebody here who's never accepted Christ, if they feel so broken that no one can put them back together, it's true, only you can. So Lord, I pray that your love and your forgiveness might fill their hearts in this moment. And let your people respond to the Holy Spirit's prompting, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.